Okay, well, hello everyone, and um, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm going to start relatively slowly, and I'm just going to start by explaining who I am. So my name is Claire Metcalf, and I work on something called the STEP Support Programme. Um, there is an email address on the screen now, and there is also a Twitter account. I couldn't find a picture of the official Twitter sign, so I've used this little rubber duck instead. There's also a website, so in the bottom of the screen you can see the website address. The website address and the email address are basically exactly the same thing, just permutated around. So if you have any questions after today about STEP, you can email me by emailing the step at maths.org email address, and I'll answer it as soon as I can. Okay, um, a little bit about how this webinar is going to work. So, um, actually, before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, the mentors who are helping today to introduce themselves. So I'm just going to stop share for a second, and I'm going to ask each of them to just say who they are, what year they're in, and what college they're at. So if my uh, helpers would like to put their cameras on, and Isaac, you popped up first, so if you want to go first. Hi, I'm Isaac, I'm a second year at Conwell and Keys. Okay, Xander, do you want to go next? Hello, my name's Xander and I'm a first year at Trinity College. And Sai. Hi, I'm Sai, I'm a second year at St John's. Brilliant, thank you very much. You can disappear again now for a bit. So uh, going back to how this webinar is going to work, there's going to be one poll. Well, actually, there's going to be two polls because we're going to have a practice poll in a second. There's going to be chat available and there's also going to be Q&A. So in the chat, you can um, post something that's relevant to what I'm saying just at that time, um, especially if it's something I haven't explained very well and you want me to go over it. I will also ask you some questions and ask you to put your answers in the chat. Um, it helps me feel that there's actually people out there and that I am not talking um, in a language that nobody understands. There is also a Q&A function. So if during the webinar there's any questions that you want to ask for us to talk about at the end, if you put that into the Q&A and we will come to that at the end of the webinar. Um, just to practice the poll, there is one poll I want to ask you, but we're just going to practice on another poll, and it's also can, lets me know that there are people out there. And the poll I'm going to launch is, what is your favourite pet? So we've got um, a few options. I didn't put down every single one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping chicken makes a stronger showing this time than it did last time. If anyone's been following the STEP Support Programme Twitter website, um, you'll know that I hatched chickens this uh, year for the first time. Okay, it looks like we have another um, day of dog people rather than cat people. Uh, poor old guinea pigs only got one vote. Okay, I'll give it another 10 seconds, just in case the nine of you left who haven't voted want to have a quick vote. Uh, okay, we'll end it there. Okay, so that's how the polling works. There will be one poll later on, um, but that's just to make sure that I know there are people out there and actually uh, doing things. Um, I've introduced you to the panelists. I should have remembered that that was my second bullet point and done that at that point, but we've already done that. I'm going to do a brief introdu introduction to what STEP is. There is on the faculty YouTube site, there's a webinar from last year where I talk in a lot more detail about STEP, but because that's already up there, I'm going to do things slightly differently this year. We're going to have a look at the STEP question. So we will go through it. We will look at the structure of the STEP question. Uh, we'll do some of it together. We probably won't finish the whole thing because I will probably talk too much about it as we go through. And then at the end, there's a chance for a bit of Q&A. So I'm gonna start with what is STEP? So STEP stands for sixth term examination paper. And it's called that because it is taken in the sixth term of your sixth form studies. There used to be about 
40 years ago, there's something called the fourth term examination papers. So you take those at about the same time that Matt and Tamura are taken now. And people would either take these exams in their fourth term, or sometimes they would stay in sixth form for a third year, and they'd take these papers as part of their seventh term. But nowadays, it's sixth term examination paper. And there used to be steps in all subjects, but I think in about 2001, I might not be quite right with my dates there, um, the other, exam, other subjects stopped using STEP, but math STEP has stayed. It's used by Cambridge, so if you have an offer to study maths at Cambridge, you'll be asked to sit STEP. There are a few other subjects that might ask you to sit a STEP paper. Um, and the other universities use it often as part of a range of offers. So if you get a good grading step, you can not do quite so well in your A-levels and you still get in. But it's a, as long as you satisfy one of the sets of conditions, you get your place. There's quite a few universities that also suggest that even if you don't want to sit the exam, you actually work through some of the papers. Um, and that's because it's recognised as a good way of introducing you to what university maths is like. There are two papers. Um, there is no longer a step one, but there are still step two and step three. Step two is based on A-level maths and AS further maths. Step three is based on A-level maths and A-level further maths. I realise that some of you won't be doing A-levels. The specifications you can find either on the Step Support Programme website, or you can go to the Cambridge Assessment and Missions Testing website, and they're also on there. It's a bit different to A-level exams in which you have a choice of questions. So there are 12 questions overall, and your marks will be based on your six best solutions. So normally we expect you to be attempting six questions. It's three hours long, so those of you who um, are quick at mental maths, that means it's about 30 minutes per question, um, but you need to factor in a little bit of time just to read through the paper. And the grades, it's different to GCSEs in that one is better than three. The top grade is S, and I think that's a, um, a, a hangover from when there used to be scholarship papers. So that was considered to be acting at a scholarship level. Uh, scholarships no longer exist. And then the grades go one, two, three, and you. And the standard offer, uh, which you might have already heard, but the standard offer for maths is one and one in step two and step three. But there are some colleges that run what's called the alternate offer. And some colleges will, will give you slightly different offers, but the standard is two grade ones in step two and step three. OK, so that was a very brief introduction to what STEP is. And now I want to actually have a look at a STEP question. So this STEP question um, is from 2007. And it is question, uh, it's a question of STEP 2. It looks quite long, but this is one of my favourite sorts of STEP questions because they actually introduce you to a bit of new maths. So you probably have not met uh, Jensen's inequality before. So that's new. It also talks about functions being concave. You might have met uh, the idea of concave, possibly in physics, through looking at lenses. Um, the, def the mathematical definition is that the second derivative is negative. So that means that as the curve moves along, the gradient is getting less negative. So if it starts positive, it's getting smaller, and then it might become negative. So it might look something like this. So gradient starts quite high, gradient decreases, uh, reaches zero, and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller, or more and more negative. So this would be a curve where the second derivative is less than zero. When I did my uh, degree, uh, the definition that I was told was it is concave if a caveman can live in it. This is supposed to be a caveman with a club. Um, 
and to be honest with you, if I am talking about a concave graph, I tend to sketch that curve, which I know a caveman can live in. And then I know from that, that that means that the second derivative is less than zero. There are lots and lots of parts of this question. So we've got something up here, which is called the stem. And in the stem of a question, anything that you're told or anything that you prove, you use throughout the rest of the question. And you get a similar idea in um, A-level questions. You might have a stem. It might tell you that A is positive. So if A is positive in the stem, that means you take A is positive throughout the whole question. Sometimes you get questions with a stem partway down the question, and then anything you're told there carries on for the rest of the question. So we have a stem. Um, the stem actually asks us to do something which is slightly different to A-levels. I don't think there's many A-level questions where the stem actually asks you to do things. But here, we have actually have a, a request. So we're going to need to think about that and actually do it. So it says show that. That's an instruction that you need to do something. After the stem, there's some different parts of the question. So we've got a part I and a part II. And then in this part here, it's also separated into two subparts. So you'd expect this lot to all be related to each other. And you expect these two parts to be somehow related to what you're asked to do in the stem. So step questions often have an awful lot of interlinking ideas going on throughout the question. You might do something in the stem. You don't then forget about it. You'll need to use it for some of the rest of the question. So let's actually start doing something. So the first part of the question says, a function f of x is said to be concave on some interval. So you can have functions where they are concave for part of the function, and then they become convex here. So this bit is concave, this bit is convex. But we could say that in this interval, it is concave. And it's asking us to show that sine x is concave in a given interval, and that log x or ln x is concave when x is bigger than zero. So we're going to start with f of x equals sine x. And we want to show that the second derivative is less than zero. So in the chat, if you know, because you might not have met it yet, can you tell me if f of x is sine x, what is f dashed of x? Okay, so it looks like there's a, a lot of people who've met this idea before. Yeah. So if f of x is sine x, then f dashed of x is cos x. And then in the chat, can you tell me what the second derivative is? Which is the point where it's very slightly more likely to go wrong, but not very. So we've got lots of minus sine x's showing up. OK, we want to show that uh, sine x is concave for naught less than x less than pi. Well, if we draw sine x between naught and pi, we can see that I'm just going to try and change color to go for a fetching purple. We can see that minus sine x has to be negative. And you can draw little diagrams to support your answers when you're working on step. It doesn't have to all be algebra. So between naught and pi, sine x is bigger than zero. Therefore, f double dashed of x is less than zero. And so sine x is concave. You'll have to excuse my handwriting. It's not good at the best of times. And using a graphics tablet, I don't find particularly easy to do. Um, but as long as it is legible, that's all that really matters. 
So that's the first one done. Now we're going to look at ln x. So f of x equals ln x. So again, in the chat, can you tell me what the derivative of ln x is? And I think people have been doing it before I've even finished speaking. Okay, so lots of people have told me it's one over x, um, or if you prefer it's x to the minus one, which you might find helps with the next part. So uh, people, have, people have guessed what I'm going to ask. Yeah, so the second derivative is going to be uh, minus x to the minus two or minus one over x squared. So we know that that is always less than zero for x not equal to zero. It gets a bit dodgy when you get to x equals zero. So we know that's always negative. So why in the chat, can you tell me why you think they've put this condition on? Because the, you know, if x was negative, minus one over x squared would still be um, negative. Yeah. So the problem here is that log x is only defined when x is greater than zero. So we now know that this is always negative, therefore log x is concave for x bigger than zero. Okay, so that's the first part of the question done. The next part is using uh, Jensen's inequality. So what we're told is that f of x is concave on a given interval. And then Jensen's inequality tells us this. And if you are dealing with um, summation, summation signs, it might help sometimes to write them out. So this side is the sum of the function at the various values. Okay, so we know that is less than or equal. Really, I'd like to write here, but there's a chance I'm going to be writing my video. 1 over n into x1 plus x2 plus xn. So sometimes it helps just to write those out like that and, and to give you a bit of an idea of what's going on. Um, there are, somebody's asked if f double dashed of x is less than or equal to zero, is f of x still concave? There are slightly different con um, definitions depending on what is actually most useful at the time. I think what the actual question said, if I go back a page, and I'm going to have scribbles all over it. What it said is, it's carefully said it is concave if the second derivative is less than zero. It hasn't said if and only if. So there's a little bit of wriggle room there. So we're not actually considering the um, less than or equal to case. Okay, so um, part I, given that A, B and C are angles of a triangle, show that this inequality is true which is quite a nice little, little inequality. Um, and it's one that you might not have seen before. So in the chat, can you suggest what function I might like to use in Jensen's inequality? And to be honest, there aren't many options. Yeah, so we've got lots of sine x's coming up. So I'm going to take f of x is sine x. I know that f of x is concave for x between naught and pi. And I also know that a, b, and c are between naught and pi. So I'm assuming it's a triangle. So I'm assuming that I've not got a one-dimensional triangle where everything's on a straight line. So we know this, so we can use Jensen's inequality. So 
I'm going to think about this expanded form here. I know that n equals three. So I'm going to get one third f of x1 plus f of x2 plus f of x3. Well, x1, x2, x3 are going to be these. So I'm going to get sine a plus sine b plus sine c has got to be less than or equal to f, which is sine, of one third a plus b plus c. OK, so this is making me feel quite happy now because this side here looks an awful lot like this. This side here, I'm going to have to do a little bit too. Um, but can anyone tell me what A plus B plus C is? Somebody said, oi, rather than pi. I like that. Now, is there anybody who can actually write a symbol pi? Because um, in, in last Saturday's, so, ah, there we go. We've even got some symbol pies as well. I need to work out how to do that. So we know that A plus B plus C is pi. So this is going to be sine of a third pi, which we know is root three over two. So we have this thing, and then we just need to multiply by three to get the actual result. Right, I'm going to delete all that and go on to the next page. Oh, let's forget about that bit. OK. Do we need to be able to work out sine, cos and tan values off the top of our heads? Uh, the answer to that is somewhere between yes and no. Um, you need to know them, but quite often I know that I'm going to just put in degrees for a second. I know that sine 30, sine 40, 5, and sine 60 take the values in some order, 1 over root 2, 1 half, and root 3 over 2. So I, I know that's true. Um, I also know that sine between 0 to 90 is increasing. So I know that this is the smallest one, this is the next smallest, and this is the biggest. And then out of these three, I know that a half, um, let me get this right, right way around. Um, I know that root three over two is the biggest one. So I know that this has to be root three over two. Um, I know that one over two is the smallest. So that's this one. And then this one is one over root two. Or you can draw a little triangle. So if you have a triangle that's meant to be an equal act of triangle, and you make that two and that one, uh, then this is 60 degrees and this is 30 degrees. And you can work out this length here by Pythagoras. Um, and then you can use that to, to work them out. So you need to either know them or be able to work them out fairly quickly. Um, and, and the main thing is knowing that you can work them out. So knowing that sine of 60 is something that you, you do you can do. OK, let's just clear that lot. OK, so now we've got part two, which is a different function. Um, at a mad guess, what do you think? So write in the chat, what do you think I'm going to take f of x to be this time? Yeah, people suggest other ways to find sine angles. I'm not going to do any more on that at the moment. OK, we've got a couple of suggestions for what function I'm going to use this time. Uh, somebody might have noticed what it is. We have some different ideas. OK, there's some people who are trying to be um, very clever about this. Uh, and some, some of you said it was also in the beginning part of the question. With, there's two things to say about this. First of all, at the beginning part of the question, it asked you to show that both sine x and log x are concave. Now, we've already used sine x, 
So we probably want to be using uh, LUNX at some point in this question. Otherwise, why did they ask us to do it? STEP doesn't normally ask you to do things which are not useful. So we think it's going to be log X, LUNX. Just want to go back of the page. Need help if I was, there we go, clear drawings. Uh, somebody else has also pointed out that it is the AMGM inequality. That is what we're trying to prove. So this side here, where we add up all the numbers and divide by the number of numbers, that is the arithmetic mean. It's the mean that you meet at GCSE. This side here, where we multiply them together and then take the nth root, is called the geometric mean. And this thing here is called the GMAM inequality. However, if you try to use the AMGM inequality to prove this question, you wouldn't get many marks because it's actually asking you to prove it. So we're going to take f of x is log x. We're going to take tk's rather than xk's. So this inequality will become 1 over n log uh, why am I writing it that way around? I was just started on the wrong side. No, I didn't. 1 over n log of t1 plus log of t2 plus, let's put some dots in, log of tn. So that's this side here. Is less than or equal to log of 1 over n into t1 plus t2 plus blah, 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 plus tn. OK, so this bit's looking nice. This is this side. But we do have a log in the way, which is a bit of a pain. And this side isn't quite there yet. However, we know something about the laws of logs. So I know that I can write this. Or you might know something about the laws of logs. You might not have met this yet. But log will basically turn these additions into multiplications. So we have this. And we can then take this power inside. So this now becomes the nth root of t1, t2, tn is less than or equal to log of t1 plus t2 plus tn. Now we have to be very slightly careful. So it looks like we're almost there. What do you think we're going to do next? So that's a question for the chat again. That might take you a bit longer to type it in this time. Yeah, so there's a, a couple of ideas. So uh, raising its power e, that works uh, because e is the inverse of log. And that's true throughout the whole range of x. Um, somebody said, I think, get rid of logs. Uh, somebody has talked about the fact that log is increasing. So the way I would probably answer this question is I'd probably say that because log is an increasing function, so I've just drawn a little picture here. So I'd probably write log increasing implies and then I'd write it down the uh, result that I'm trying to show. So you do get some step questions which ask you to look at things like um, tan A equals tan B. Or tan A is less than tan B. Um, if you've got something like tan A equals tan B, then it, that doesn't imply that A equals B. But because log X is an increasing function, it means that if log is something here, so if log A is less than log B, then working back, that means that A is less than B. 
if log was a decreasing function, or if we had something else that was a decreasing function, I'm going to try and work out where I can fit this in. So if you had a function that did something like this, and you knew that f of a was less than or equal to f of b, then this would actually tell you that a was greater than or equal to b. So the fact that you're saying it increase, it's increasing just means that you can get rid of those logs and the inequality still holds. Okay, clear drawings. Next page. Okay, I'm going to have a quick look at part A of this and then we're going to go to questions and answers and I'll let you um, do we, okay, I'm just gonna answer the question that's come up in chat. Do we have to say that log X is strictly increasing? Uh, to be honest, you probably should have said it was strictly increasing. Um, I think for this question, as long as you have shown that you know that it's increasing, that's fine. Um, the problem with, well, I suppose if it wasn't strictly increasing because it is a non-strict inequality, you'd still be fine. So because we are proving that, um, so I need to get my, pen back because we were looking at showing f of a less than or equal to f of b gives you a less than or equal to b not strictly yeah it wasn't strict inequality so it's fine Xander just said very very neatly what I was trying to say quite uh, vaguely so let's go to the next question okay so we have shown this result and then we have an instruction that says hence. So in any question which says hence, you have to use what has just been proven. Sometimes you'll get questions that say hence or otherwise. If you get a question that says hence or otherwise, you can use a different method. However, most of the time otherwise isn't as nice a method to use. So we're going to look at hence. We've got these things here and we've got this inequality. So first question is, how many terms do you think I'm going to take? So what do you think N is going to equal? Okay, we've got lots of suggestions of four. So I'm going to take n equals four. Um, I'm going to take this to be my t1, this to be my t2, t3, and this one over here to be t4. My hour has gone a little bit wonky. So I know that the fourth root of 16, because I'm going to stick that at the front because it looks nicer. Y to 4, Z to the 4 has got to be less than or equal to X to the 4 plus Y to the 4 plus Z to the 4 plus 16 all over 4. Okay, that looks quite nice. We can take the fourth root here. 16 is quite nicely 2 to the power 4. So we've got 2xyz is less than or equal to this thing. I'm going to be lazy and just put some ditto marks. And then we can multiply by 4. So we get 8xyz is less than or equal to x to the 4 plus y to the 4 plus z to the 4 plus 16. Okay, so that was, that was quite nice. I mean, obviously they're the wrong way around, but um, you can just... Um, permutate the two sides uh, and swap the inequality around. So very, very briefly, I'm not going to do this last part. This is part for you to go away and have a play with. So for this one, I've just put part A back in as well so I can compare them. We are trying to find the minimum value of this. So here we've got an x to the 5, y to the 5, and a z to the 5. Okay, well that's a bit like these, apart from there to the power 5. Um, we've got a 5 creeping in here. So when you're trying to do this part, 
it might be a good idea if you can try and show something like this first. And then you might be able to find what the minimum value is. So from this one here, this would tell me that x to the 4 plus y to the 4 plus z to the 4 minus 8xyz has got to be bigger than or equal to minus 16. I have got my minus signs right, the right way around, I think, which tells us that the minimum value of this thing must be minus 16 because it's bigger than or equal to minus 16. So try and use those two parts together um, to work out what the answer to B is. And if you're trying to find this question, I'll just tell you where it is again. It's 2007, step two, question seven. Okay, clear some drawings, next page. Um, I'm gonna talk very little bit about, about um, oh, would we need to then find them? It doesn't actually say that you actually need to find X, Y, and Z. It just says you need to find the minimum value. I mean, I would be tempted once I found the minimum value to then actually stick in an X, Y, and Z to make it the minimum. And from Jensen's inequality, you know that you get equality if everything is the same. So my, my guess would be that when X, Y, and Z are all the same, then we'd get the minimum but it hasn't actually told you you need to find them. So you wouldn't actually need to do that. But a brief bit about preparing for step and then we'll do some questions and answers. So um, I'm going to launch my second poll here. Uh, my second poll is going to be about the step support program. Um, so there's three questions. I've just launched it. No, it's not three questions, three options. Um, have you heard about or used the STEP support program? So this is also quite useful for us to, to try and work out whether um, people who are thinking about doing maths at university have heard about this uh, yet. Okay, so we've got 85% of you voted. So I think there's about 10 more people to vote. So if anyone else would like to vote. Okay, I'll just give it five more seconds. So if anyone else wants to vote to count, do it now. Okay, end polling. Okay, so the majority of you have heard about it and quite a lot of you are using some of the resources, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, some of you haven't heard about it yet, so I will talk a little bit about that. So uh, we realise that step questions are very different to A-level and you kind of have to get used to the style of step questions. So we've prepared something called the step support programme and I'll just show you what that looks like. So if you go to, if you do a Google for uh, step support programme, you'll find it. If not, maths.org slash step will take you there. And we have various modules. So we would suggest in year 12 that you start working through the foundation modules. The first one is, um, the first few are designed to technically only need GCSE level maths. They are much harder than GCSE, but it won't matter if you haven't met something at A level yet. So the first one here, it starts with, um, a few questions about uh, certs. Um, it goes into a preparation, which gives you some of the skills that you're going to need to do the step question. So you can see here, we've got um, an algebraic equation to solve. Um, and then there's a little bit about repeated roots of uh, quadratic, quadratics. Then you have the step question and you can see straight away that this is slightly different to the preparation because we've got A's and B's here, whereas before we had threes and ones. Um, that's a very step type thing to have um, unknowns rather than numbers in your equation. Um, there's a little bit of a discussion about the question. And then at the end, there is a warm down. Uh, sometimes these are just quite fun results, uh, geometry problems. Sometimes they introduce new areas of maths, uh, like fractals or Diophantine equations. 
um, and, and sometimes they're logic puzzles and they're, they're, they're just meant to be something fun. There are also hints and partial solutions. The, I, we've said partial solutions. They are relatively full solutions. There's not a lot missing, but there might be one or two steps that you have to fill in yourself. So there are 25 of those. We would suggest doing one a week. Um, you might want to go through them a bit quicker if you want to. And then there are step two modules and step three modules. And those are based around different areas of the step specification. So one of the things I would suggest if you are applying to a university which interviews for maths, I would have a work through the curve sketching module before you go to interview, uh, because curve sketching is something that quite often gets asked at interview. Um, you might need the step two calculus module before you do the curve sketching, because when you're sketching curves, you need to consider the gradient and things like that. Um, we've also got some uh, notes on some A-level topics. Uh, we've not got very far with those so far, but we've done some algebra, coordinate geometry and calculus. Um, those are just taking some A-level topics and then approaching them from a slightly more step-like viewpoint, if you like. There are topic notes for all of these modules as well. So if you want to work for the SEP2 calculus module, you can download the topic notes. We should tell you everything you need to know in order to do the questions. So all the results or, or inequal, um, identities, um, equations, this sort of thing should all be in there. Okay, so that's the step support program. Uh, the next thing is uh, there is a booklet written by Stephen Siklos. Now Stephen uh, ran step from 1987 to 2019 when he sadly died. Um, so he has um, years and years and years of experience and he wrote a book about um, doing STEP and also preparing to do maths at university. So you can find this on the STEP support program website. We've got useful links down the side and there's one that says Stephen Siklos's advanced problems in mathematics book. Um, if you click there it will take you to this page um, you can buy it as a paperback if you want to, but you can also download it for free. So if you want, if you want an actual copy, um, a physical copy, you can do that. If not, you can just download it. And in that, there are lots of step problems. Um, many of them are ones that uh, Stephen wrote. Um, many of them he has backstories about. So there's, so there's one about um, chocolate oranges. And he talks about how after he wrote this step question, he contacted the manufacturers of chocolate oranges to see if he could get some for free, um, but he didn't. Um, and it's, it's, it's a nice read because it's got lots of um, you know, little stories like that as well. Uh, just make sure that you've got the new revised edition uh, because that's brought us up to date with the changes to uh, STEP in 2019. Um, but it does still mention STEP 1 because that happened after this book was revised. Let's just go back to here. There's something called the STEP database. So that you can also find from the STEP support program. So down here, we have a link to the STEP question database. And this is a database of all the STEP questions up to 2018. Uh, we haven't put the last couple of years on yet. And you can search for topics. So if you want to practice STEP questions on a certain topic, you can do. There is also a C1 tag, that is supposed to find the step questions that only need a little bit of A-level knowledge. So it's based on the old C1 modules from when A-levels had modules. Um, it's not a perfect tag system. Um, it was tagged by a PhD student who sometimes didn't always understand what C1 meant. So you might get some questions which require you to differentiate log X. Uh, which you might not meet in the first year of A-levels. But it's, it's a, a reasonably useful guide. Um, so we have a question here about um, a, a bike riding competition, uh, which is basically a logic question and working systematically. Um, you can also find past papers. So again, on the STEP support program website, there is a link to um, 
the Emissions Testing Service website. Um, here, from here, you can download all of the set papers up to 2020. Um, I would suggest that you don't work, start working through set papers yet. I would start working through the set support program first um, because that will, those will be more carefully selected ones where you should have the knowledge to do them. Um, if you start working through step papers now, there might be a lot of work on there that you haven't yet covered. Um, if you do want to work through some step papers, start with step one, even though that's no longer exam that exists, it is still using the same sort of ideas as step two and step three, and it's still the same sort of question. Okay. Um, okay, I think that was everything I wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm going to stop share. I'm going to ask my helpers to come back and we're going to have a look at the questions and answers. Okay, I will start by answering this first question, which is about um, the step support modules. Um, so if you get really stuck on a step question, would you recommend moving on to the next assignment or looking through the work solution? So I would suggest if you get really stuck, uh, perhaps move on to the next assignment first but certainly give yourself a break from the question. So uh, sleep on it, come back to it the next day. Um, all that is a really good idea because you find your brain sort of starts mulling it over. And when you come back to it fresh, you might have some different ideas. Once you've done that and you still don't know how to do it, then please do have a look at the work solution. I'm a big believer in that it is much, much better to use a work solution to help you complete the question rather than just never being able to do the question. Yeah, so work, work through the question with the work solution next to you. You might want to do a little bit of it, then look at a bit of the work solution, then keep going. Um, don't just read the work solution, but do use it to help you complete the question. Okay, so I've done that one. Okay. Um, I think these questions are all for me, so I'll answer these. Um, if you have any questions also that you'd like to ask our helpers, please do. Um, is it realistic to make one module a day of step prep? Um, I think that's talking about the foundation modules. Uh, it depends how much else you've got on. Um, if you've got lots of schoolwork, it might not be realistic. Um, if you're working through them in the summer, um, it might be realistic to do one module a day. Um, I would give yourself a break as well. I'd have make sure you have some days where you don't do any step uh, and just have a day off and go, go out to the park or something. OK, uh, question for the students so that I don't have to talk for a second. Um, how did you prepare for step? Who'd like to go first? Oh, well, sure. Yep. Um, I guess the best thing to do is just trying lots of practice questions like there's sort of, you know, benefits to maybe reading through notes or reading books and things like that, but you're not really going to get much out of them unless you put it into practice. So doing the step support modules to start with, and then eventually moving on to like doing questions from papers and then finally like full sort of papers, um, or maybe not like all of the questions from paper, but like time yourself for three hours um, and just see what you can do. Um, yeah, that's got to be the best way to practice. Would anyone like to add to that? I've just got rid of the question, which uh, perhaps doesn't help. Uh, yeah, um, I've, I mean, when, yeah, all you need to do is um, once you sort of know all the maths, which will come sort of towards the end of your second year in A-level, um, all you need to do is just practice the questions themselves um, and that's the only way you're going to get better at the actual exam um, I think Claire what you say to do is sort of do you say start with um like sort of 2016 2018 that sort of thing like work backwards and yeah, then you, the more recent ones you do those to like actually time yourself closest to the time yeah so thinking about um in year 13 when you might want to start looking at um whole papers um, leave about the the most recent five to do nearer the time and then start working backwards. You don't want to do 1987 rather than 2014. You want to make sure you do the more recent ones. 
So start in 2016, work backwards, and then when you're a couple of weeks before the actual exams, start working for the last five. Okay, uh, this one's for you lot. Um, did you find it difficult to study A-levels and practice for STEP at the same time? I guess I can answer this. Um, I think practicing for STEP was definitely practice for A-levels as well, particularly with the peer courses. And sort of when it came to tackling the harder questions um, on my A-level papers, because I had done lots of STEP papers, they felt a, a lot less daunting. Um, but also it's important to kind of um, make sure you know everything on the A-level syllabus as well when doing steps. So it, it's kind of like practicing step will help with your A-levels, but also knowing your A-level really well will help you with step. So it's um, good practice for both. Okay, there's a question here I'm going to answer. Uh, the question is, what are the main colleges you suggest for maths? Um, the thing to remember this is that all your lectures are held together. So everybody, no matter what college you go to, goes to the same lectures. Um, supervisions tend to be done in college, at least for the first couple of years. In the third year, uh, groups of colleges get together to supervise. So I wouldn't suggest a college for maths. What I would suggest is to, if you can, come and visit Cambridge when it's allowed and have a look around the colleges and just get a feeling for which one you actually want to live at for three years. Um, the other thing is to not get too, too um, worried about your choice of college uh, because what we find is that everybody, even if they apply to one college and end up at another college, really likes the college that they end up at. Um, so, Come and come for a day, have a look around. Um, you might have some, some preferences as to whether you're in the city centre or slightly further out. Um, but there's no, no college that would say, yes, do that one for maths. Um, oh, uh, here, here's an easy one to answer. Um, are there, is there, is there many questions on stats mechanics in step or is it mainly pure maths? There are 12 questions per paper, eight of them are pure, two of them are mechanics and two of them are um, stats, stats or probability. So there are mostly pure, but there's also some mechanics and stats as well. And when do we have to do the step? You do step in June of year 13. So uh, you apply in October, um, interviews are December, you get your offers in January, and then you would sit step in um, June. Okay. Um, Xander, have you got that link somewhere that, about different colleges and um, applications and how many people get in? Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, if you could put that into the nice. chat and that might answer the question about um, competitiveness. Uh, yeah. I'll just get that. Okay. Um, while Sander's doing that, Isaac and Sai, um, how did you select the six questions to complete in the exam? Um, it's really hard to say because which questions you choose to answer is a very personal thing. Like that's why there are 12 on every paper because not everybody has the same strengths and weaknesses. And so um, it's nice to have an idea in mind before you go into the papers of the type of questions that you typically try and answer like if you really like integration questions you might tell yourself if there's an integration that question that comes up then i'm definitely going to try that one um or like some geometry questions and things like that um you might tell yourself i'm never going to answer any mechanics or any probability which i would advise against because i know for a fact that i like benefited greatly from deciding to take a mechanics question in my step two paper i think it was despite the fact i'd done no preparation for step mechanics it was just a level um so like try not to rule anything out completely but maybe just sort of have a plan in mind of the type of questions you might like to attempt and just to add to that um also practice choosing questions when um so make sure you have time to like sit down near near the near the exams make sure you have time to sit down and just practice choosing questions um, because it's really a skill to 
to learn. Okay, uh, somebody has asked, are there any resources we can use if we run out of past step questions? Um, there are over 1,400 step questions. Um, I, I would be impressed if you do run out of step questions. Um, one of the things I found that's fairly similar, that there are some New Zealand um, papers, some New Zealand calculus papers, I think, something like that, um, which, which are vaguely similar. But I mean, to be honest, if you've done every single step question that there is, maybe look at some map questions as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise using um, Olympiads to prepare for step because they are quite different in style. Um, but saying that all mass practice is good mass practice. So if you have completely run out of things to do, do some of that. I'd say as well, there's also the, the Solomon papers, um, which are not very well known, but um, they're more of the A-level style than step style, but the difficulty is more like step. So it's still really good practice to do those. If you just Google like Edexcel Solomon papers, you'll probably find them. Um, but that was kind of what I was doing towards the end after I maybe got a bit bored of step and was trying to do some of the level stuff. Um, they're quite nice. Um, here's a good question. Um, can I still manage to prepare for step with no instructor? Uh, the, answer, the answer basically is yes. I think an awful lot of the, the people who are doing maths at Cambridge prepared for step by themselves. Um, so some of them were the only person from their, their school doing step and their teachers couldn't support them. Um, that, that's why we have the step support program and uh, all the other material that you need to prepare. I don't know if, if any of uh, my helpers want to um, <laughs> chip in there as well with more, ha having prepared for step more recently than I did. Yeah, like the vast majority of my preparation was an individual thing, but if you kind of look out there, there is help that you can get. So it, if you get an offer, there's the offer holders day you would normally have um, for state school students in Cambridge, or this year there's a webinar series. Um, there's also kind of various other schemes that offer like free helps, like preparing for step. Um, some of them are more useful than others, like not to point figures at some of them that aren't great, but like they're, they're all worth a try because it might just work for you. So have a Google, speak to whoever you can and try and find something if you're struggling to do it on your own. Okay, there, there is a specific question for Xander. Um, is it true you have a stronger feeling as a mass community at Trinity as you have more mass students there? I don't know if you can compare it. Uh, well, yeah, I, I can't compare to experiences at other colleges, but um, I can say that being the largest college with a huge number of um, mathematicians in each year, um, there's, I, I think the best thing about it is there's always sort of someone you can ask for help if you need it, because um, you've got so many people you know that are doing maths. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's nice having them. But at the same time, you sort of often will avoid making friends of like people who aren't doing maths because you don't need to, uh, which isn't necessarily the best thing. So if you do go to a college with loads of um, math modes, then try and make friends of other people as well. Otherwise, you'll be in a very little math mathy bubble and it's difficult to escape. Um, would anybody from a contrasting college like to <laughs> say anything on that one? yeah well there are only about eight students at keys every year and so you kind of tend to know them very well um like we all know each other quite well and i live with like three of the other students just like in the same house so you still have that like close bubble of math students if you want it at other colleges um but yeah you might be encouraged to make friends who do other subjects a bit more as well and i think sometimes you also get to know mathematicians at other colleges um, as well. You know, you're not just confined to your one college. Okay, I think done that one. Um, there's a couple more questions. Um, there's two here which are very similar, so I'm going to try and answer these at the same time. Uh, should you still do step if you haven't been made an offer? 
and does STEP help bridge the gap between school and university level maths? So basically the answer to both of those is yes. Um, so the reason that a lot of other universities recommend that you work through STEP papers. So for example, Oxford recommend that you work through some STEP papers. Um, they don't recommend necessarily that you sit STEP, but they recommend you, you do some of the work on it. And, and that is to, to help you get used to the difference between school style maths and university level maths. So yes, you should still do it. You don't necessarily have to sit it, but still work through some. And yes, it does help you bridge the gap. Okay, uh, I'm aware that we are starting to run out of time. Um, somebody's asked how many questions should you do as practice? Um, that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. Um, enough. <laughs> um, in the actual paper, should you attempt each question briefly or immediately focus on the six you like the look of? I would say that trying to attempt all 12 is probably not a good idea. Um, I would always start by, by looking at the questions that you like the look of, maybe working through them until you get stuck and then going on to one of the other ones that you like the look of, and then you can come back later. I don't know if anyone has anything they want to add to that one. Yeah, I'd say there's probably more of a benefit to spending whatever time you have getting the six questions you've chosen to do to a better standard than there is trying a new question. Because once you've answered six questions, if you start to answer a seventh, you have to do better than your worst than the other six to actually gain anything from it. So you're kind of in a bit of a time deficit there. That's a good answer. I like that one. Um, somebody's asked, would you be marked down if you didn't answer a variety of questions? Uh, nope, there is no restriction on question choice. There is no advantage or disadvantage to how do you uh, pick them. Um, each question is marked out of 20. Um, and if you get your marks on pure questions, you know, that's absolutely fine. If you get your answers on mechanics and stats, that's completely fine. If the grades are just based on how many marks you've got. So I've done that one. I've done that one. Um, do you have to answer a question, completely answer a question to get order to get the marks? Um, you have to answer the question completely correctly to get all 20 marks. Um, quite often, there is a bit of a trade when you're doing the exam, this is there's a bit of a trade off. Is it worthwhile you spending another 10 minutes trying to nail down the last two marks? Or should you go and do another question? No, it's slightly different to when you are practicing. When you're practicing, try and make sure that you always uh, dot all the I's and cross all the T's and that you've thought about everything in the exam. It's a bit different. Right, and I'm going to answer one more question. Um, any other questions that people want to know, um, send me an email. Because um, we've just had about 50 questions come in at once. Um, can we only use maths that is met in standard syllabus when answering step questions? Um, the answer is basically no, but we try and write step questions so that you don't have an advantage through knowing things which are beyond the specification. So there shouldn't be any step question where using something beyond the specification is extremely useful. Um, normally I say that if you have assumed something and it is now made the step question completely trivial and you can do it in about three lines, you probably should not be using it. Um, if there are some techniques which are, are basically A-level techniques, just taking a little bit further, they're probably okay to use. Um, don't leave too much work for the examiner to do. So if you're using a technique which basically takes out all of the working, then you might not have sufficiently shown enough working to justify your results. I think that vaguely made sense. Um, I will have a look at all the other questions that have been asked, um, but I'm aware that we've now run out of time um, and I'll see if I can get answers to, to those questions uh, to you in some way, shape or form. Um, so thank you very much for coming and have a great rest of the day.